Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria, the paper. Today we're going to be discussing a paper. Next week we'll discuss what happened to it, um, which is also informative. But to give you background for what we'll discuss next week, we're going to talk about the paper itself. Um, the paper is written by um, uh, Dr. Littman in, in this year, just in fact was uh, published this August, and um, it's in PLOS One, it's a peer-reviewed literature, and it's entitled Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria in Adolescents and Young Adults, a Study of Parental Reports. It's a preliminary study and it recognizes that. Uh, it is available online um, <coughs> and um, uh, first, we'll go over the abstract, and uh, the abstract is one of these divided abstract that, that, that has purpose and then uh, data and then conclusions. Purpose in online forums, parents have been reporting that their children are experiencing what is described here as rapid onset gender dysphoria. Appearing for the first time during puberty or even after its completion. The onset of gender dysphoria seems to seem to occur in the context of belonging to a peer group where one, multiple, or even all of the friends have become gender dysphoric and transgender identified during the same time frame. Parents also report that their children exhibited an increase in social media internet use prior to disclosure of a transgender identity. The purpose of this study was to document and explore these observations and describe the resulting presentation of gender dysphoria, which is inconsistent with existing research literature. Methods, recruiting information, recruitment information with a link to a 90 question survey consisting of multiple choice, Likert type, and open-ended questions was placed on three websites where parents had reported rapid onsets of gender dysphoria actually three kind of collecting grounds. Um, website monitors and potential participants were encouraged to share the recruitment information and link to the survey with any individuals or communities that they thought might include eligible participants to expand the reach of the project through snowball sampling techniques. It wasn't re restricted to the people on those websites. That's just where they started. Data were collected anonymously via SurveyMonkey, which is apparently something that's used a number of times. I've been asked to visit SurveyMonkey for other surveys. Um, quantitative findings are presented as frequencies, percentages, ranges, means, and or medians. Open-ended responses from two questions were targeted for qualitative analysis for themes. So they're going to just basically collect the data and then present it to you. Results, there were 256 parent completed surveys that met study criteria. The adolescent and young adult children described were predominantly female sex at birth, 82.8%, with a mean of 16.4 years. 41% of the uh, adolescents and young adults had expressed a non-heterosexual sexual orientation before identifying as transgender. Many, most, of the adolescents or young adults had been uh, diagnosed with at least one mental health disorder or neurodevelopmental disability prior to the onset of their gender dysphoria. Uh, a range of the number of pre-existing diagnoses obviously had to include zero because some of them didn't, but there were as many as seven in some cases. In 36.8, a substantial minority of the friendship dis groups, groups described, the majority of the members became transgender identified. The most likely outcomes were that adult, uh, pardon me, ad adolescent or young adult mental health, uh, well-being well and parent-child relationships became worse. Notice a value judgment there. 
since adolescents or young adults came out. AYAs expressed a range of behaviors that included expressing distrust of non-transgender people. Anybody remember, uh, don't believe anybody over 30? Uh, stopping spending time with non-transgender friends, trying to isolate themselves from their families, and only trusting information about gender dysphoria from transgender sources. The rest is all fake news. Conclusion, rapid onset gender dysphoria describes a phenomenon where the development of gender dysphoria is observed to begin suddenly during or after puberty in an adolescent or young adult who would not have met criteria for gender dysphoria in childhood. Rapid onset gender dysphoria appears to re re represent an entity that is distinct from the gender dysphoria observed in individuals who have previously been described as transgender, usually having disturbances all the way through childhood. The worsening of mental well-being and parent-child relationships and behaviors that isolate adolescents and young adults from their parents, families, non-transgender friends, and mainstream sources of information are particularly concerning. More research is needed to better understand this phenomenon, its implications, and scope. So with that, you can see the person writing this is clearly not pretending that all of the answers are in. Just that there are some answers that don't fit the data. The paper begins with data availability. The data cannot be made public, or no, this is a, a separate section. The data cannot be made publicly available due to ethical restrictions. You can imagine what some people would do if they knew who these people were. The study participants did not provide consent to have their responses shared publicly, shared in public databases, or shared with outside researchers. Furthermore, due to the sensitive information contained in the data and the politicized and contentious discourse around the study of gender dysphoria, protection of the privacy of the participants responding to the survey is of utmost importance. If you want to read more about all this stuff, I recommend you go to the original article. There's a small part I omitted. Funding, um, you know, this is a death now. The author received no specific funding for this work. Yes. If, if I could just, uh, just uh, can we pass the mic back? Thank you. If I could just uh, comment um, on the previous slide, um, I think that there's certain circumstances where you know um, sources need to be protected, whether it's uh, in in a in a scientific study or in the media. Um, oh, don't worry. I mean, the Adventist Health Study, for example, has codes and stuff and nothing is stored specifically so that people can't go through and snoop because you know you can imagine uh, uh, somebody hunting for elder so-and-so who actually confesses to eating meat once uh, I mean these right. are you know if you want honest answers you cannot have uh, people knowing that their answers will be displayed for everybody to see attached to them I exactly so are you saying that there's uh no particular circumstance in which people shouldn't be able to look at even um, data that's been anonymized? Okay, well as a matter of fact, of course. Uh, uh, in this particular instance we're going to read quotes from specific people. It just won't say who it is. Um, that in this day and age would be called doxing. and I think is unethical and obviously the person writing the paper agrees. Introduction, we're going to start now. In recent years a number of parents have been reporting in online discussion groups such as, uh, well, you can read those, num those uh, websites, that their adolescent and young adult children who have had no histories of childhood gender identity issues experienced a rapid onset of gender dysphoria. Parents have described clusters of gender dysphoria uh, outbreaks occurring in pre-existing friend groups with multiple or even all members of a friend group becoming gender dysphoric and transgender identified in a pattern that seems statistically unlikely based on previous research. 
Remember the current um, story is that uh, this is all uh, genetically or perhaps prenatally done and so the person has no control over what's going on and that therefore uh, there are certain, uh, you know, you can't blame people for behavior that they have no control over. Um, and, and therefore it's a civil right to allow people to be trans. Parents describe a process of immersion in social media such as binge watching YouTube transition videos and excessive use of Tumblr immediately preceding their child becoming gender dysphoric. These descriptions are atypical for the presentation of gender dysphoria, at least as previously reported, um, and raise the question of whether social influences may be contributing to or even driving these occurrences of gender dysphoria in some populations of adolescents and young adults. For the purpose of this study, rapid onset gender dysphoria is defined, and they took pains to try to make sure that nobody without this got into the study, um, as a type of adolescent onset or late onset, either one, gender dysphoria, person doesn't like the gender that they, the natal gender as they sometimes put it, um, where the development of gender dysphoria is observed to begin suddenly during or after puberty in an adolescent or young adult who would not have met criteria for gender dysphoria in childhood. People are apparently normal and suddenly they want to be trans. This study was designed to describe rapid onset gender dysphoria. Notice it's just to describe it, it's not to assess its prevalence or uh, the, the probability of having various subgroups and for that reason it's, it's an observational study strictly. Um, and to generate hypotheses, including the role of social and peer contagion in the development of this condition. Background, gender dysphoria in an adolescence. Gender dysphoria is dis defined as an individual's persistent discomfort with their biological sex or assigned gender. Two types of gender dysphoria studied include early onset gender dysphoria where the symptoms of gender dysphoria begin in early childhood and late onset gender dysphoria where the symptoms begin after puberty. Late onset gender dysphoria that occurs during adolescence is now called adolescent onset GD. And so it looks like they're including adolescent onset GD in their study but not the other. The majority of adolescents who present for care for gender dysphoria are individuals who experience early onset gender dysphoria that persisted or worsened with puberty, although a, an atypical presentation has been described where adolescents who did not experience childhood symptoms present with new symptoms in adolescence. So this is uh, statistically a, a minor presentation. Adolescent onset of gender dysphoria is a relatively new phenomenon for natal females. In fact, prior to 2012, there were little or no research studies about adolescent females with gender dysphoria first beginning in adolescence. So this is really kind of a brand new thing to look at. Thus, far more is known about adolescents with early onset gender dysphoria than adolescents with adolescent onset gender dysphoria, which it would be one of our, uh, would fall into the category we're studying now. Although, not all research studies on gender dysphoria adolescents exclude those with adolescent uh, onset dysphoria. It is important to note that most of the studies on adolescents, particularly those about gender dysphoria persistence and desistance, that is, do they grow out of it, so to speak, um, and outcomes for the use of puberty suppression, cross-sex hormones, and surgery, all of the things that people might do to try to change gender, um, uh, only included subjects whose gender dysphoria began in childhood and subjects with adolescent onset gender dysphoria would not have met inclusion criteria for these studies. So they're saying that the studies were done specifically excluding the group that we're looking at now. Therefore, most of the research on adolescents with gender dysphoria to date is not generalizable to adolescents experiencing adolescent onset gender dysphoria. Now, 
I would have to say, to be strictly logical, it could be generalizable, it's just we don't know. Um, but, uh, and outcomes for individuals adolescent gender, uh, adolescent onset gender dysphoria, including persistent and desistance rates and outcome for treatment are currently unknown. So there really hasn't been much research in this specific sub-area. As recently as 2012, there were only two clinics, one in Canada and one in the Netherlands, that had gathered enough data to provide empirical information about the main issues for gender dysphoric adolescents, reference 18. Both institutions concluded that the management of adolescent uh, onset gender dysphoria is more complicated than the management of early onset gender dysphoria, and that individuals with adolescent onset are more likely to have significant psychopathology. Something else wrong with them as well, depression, whatever. Um, the presentation of gender dysphoria can occur in the context of severe psychiatric disorders, developmental difficulties, or as part of large-scale identity issues, and for these patients, medical transition might not be advisable. Now, I want you to notice that's not Littman's opinion, that is somebody else's opinion. The APA Task Force on the Treatment of Gender Identity Disorder notes that, the, that adolescents with gender dysphoria should be screened carefully to detect the emergence of the desire for sex reassignment in the context of trauma, as well as any other disorders such as schizophrenia, mania, psychotic depression, that may produce gender confusion. When present, such psychopathology must be addressed and taken into account prior to assisting the adolescent's decision as to whether to or not to pursue sex reassignment or actually assisting the adolescent with the gender transition. Strong recommendation, that's the American Psychiatric Association saying, don't just do it, check first and maybe even work on those other issues first. And then if the, the gender dysphoria persists, think about transition. Social and peer contagion. The description of cluster outbreaks of gender dysphoria occurring in pre-existing groups of friends and increased, increased exposure to social media, internet preceding a child's announcement of a transgender identity raises the possibility of social and peer conta contagion. How dare you say that? Um, social contagion is the spread of, of affect or behaviors throughout, through a population. Peer contagion, in particular, is a process by where an individual and peer mutually influence each other, or I, I would assume, or peers, mutually influence each other in a way that promotes emotions and behaviors that can potentially undermine their own development or harm others. And notice that implicit in that is the possibility that trans uh, behavior and tr trans hormone surgery, et cetera, could potentially undermine their own development or harm others. Peer contagion has been associated with depressive symptoms, disordered eating, aggression, bullying, and drug use. Internalizing symptoms such as depression can be spread via the mechanisms of co-rumination, which entails the repetitive discussion of problems, excessive reassurance seeking, and negative feedback. Deviancy training, which was first described for rule-breaking delinquency and aggression, is the process whereby attitudes and behaviors associated with problem behaviors are promoted with positive reinforcement by peers. I suppose one could say gangs at that point. Peer contagion has been shown to be a factor in several aspects of eating disorders, anorexia nervosa. There are examples in the eating disorder and anorexia nervosa literature of how both internalizing symptoms and behaviors have been shared and spread via peer influences, which may have relevance to considerations of rapid onset gender dysphoria. Friendship cliques can set the norms for preoccupation with one's body, one's body image, and techniques for weight loss, and can predict an individual's body image concerns and eating behaviors. So 
So anorexia can be spread by peers. Peer influence is intensified in inpatient and outpatient treatment settings for patients with anorexia and counter-therapeutic subcultures that actively promote the beliefs and behaviors of anorexia nervosa have been observed. References. Oops. Uh, there. Yeah. In these settings, there is a group dynamic where the best anorexics, those who are the thinnest, most resistant to gaining weight, and interestingly, who have experienced the most medical complications from their disease, are admired, validated, and seen as authentic, while the patients who want to recover from anorexia and cooperate with medical treatment are maligned, ridiculed, and marginalized. Additionally, behaviors associated with deceiving parents and doctors about eating and weight loss, referred to as the anorexic tricks, are shared by patients with him in a manner akin to deviancy training. There's a parallel between gangs and anorexia nervosa gangs, can we call it that? Online environments provide ample opportunity for excessive reassurance seeking, co-rumination, positive and negative feedback, and deviancy training from peers who, dis who subscribe to unhealthy self-harming behaviors. The pro-eating disorder sites provide motivation for extreme weight loss, sometimes calling the motivational content thinspiration. Such sites promote validation of eating disorders as an identity and offer tips and tricks for weight loss and for deceiving parents and doctors so that the individuals may continue their weight loss activities. If similar mechanisms are at work in the context of gender dysphoria, think about this. This greatly complicates the evaluation and treatment of impacted adolescents and young adults. In the past decade, there has been an increase in visibility, social media, and user-generated online content about transgender issues and transition, which may act as a double-edged sword. Um, notice, she is um, arguing that there is good and there is bad. On the one hand, an increase in visibility has given a voice to individuals who had been underdiagnosed and undertreated in the past. <clears throat> On the other hand, it is plausible that online content may encourage vulnerable individuals to believe that nonspecific symptoms and vague feelings <coughs> excuse me, should be interpreted as gender dysphoria stemming from a transgender condition. Uh, that's not an exaggeration, as we'll see. Um, I'm not going to read the whole paper, obviously, but I'm going to talk about the role of social media and online content. Concern has been raised that adolescents may come to believe that transition is the only solution to their individual situations, that exposure to internet contents that is uncritically positive about transition may intensify these beliefs, and that those teens may pressure doctors for immediate medical treatment. And it sounds like she shares those concerns. She mentions Reddit and Tumblr, where online advice promotes the idea that nonspecific symptoms should be considered to be gender dysphoria conveys an urgency to transition and instructs individuals how to deceive parents, doctors, and therapists to obtain hormones quickly. So, and fig uh, figure one is actually um, just a, a list of some of those quotes, and you'll notice that they are cited as coming from Reddit. Okay, TLDR finds out what they want to hear. This is instructions on lying. Uh, find out what they want to hear if they're going to give you therapy or treatment and then tell them just that. It's about getting treatment, not about being true to those around you. It's not their business and a lot of doctors, a lot of time doctors will screw up stuff for you. So much for candidness. Get a story ready in your head, and as suggested, keep the lie to a minimum. And only for stuff that can't be verified, like how you were feeling but were, was too afraid to tell anyone, including your family. Sorry, the grammar is straight off the internet. I'd also look up the DSM for the diagnostic criteria for transgender and make sure your story fits it, assuming you're psych. I assume that psychologist or psychiatrist, follows the DSM, I assume. 
Um, and then urgency to transition. If you don't do it when you're young, you will be miserable and unhappy with your body for the rest of your life. Got to get it done now. And then, vague and non-specific symptoms called signs of gender dysphoria. Signs of indirect gender dysphoria. Continually difficulty with simply getting through the day. Now, think about this. How many teenage children do you know who haven't had this? A sense of misalignment, disconnect, or estrangement from your own emotions. A feeling of just going through the motions in everyday life as if you're always reading from a script. A seeming pointlessness to your life and no sense of any real meaning or ultimate purpose. I would say that was a problem with atheism, but you know, that's just me. Uh, knowing you're somehow different from everybody else and, think, and wishing you could be normal like them. Again, ask yourself how many teenagers how many times when you were a teenager do you remember feeling like this? Um, purpose. This is back to the paper. Rapid presentation of adolescent onset gender dysphoria and gender dysphoria cases occurring in clusters of pre-existing friend groups is not consistent with current knowledge about gender dysphoria obtained from these people who've had it all, all their life and has not been described in the scientific literature to date. So we're putting it in the scientific literature. The purpose of this research is, one, to describe an atypical presentation of gender dysphoria occurring with sudden and rapid onset in adolescents and young adults, and two, to generate hypotheses about the condition, including the role of social and peer contagion in its development. Materials and methods, I'm going to skip over that. It's relatively short and relatively obvious. Um, participants during the recruitment period, 256 parents com completed online surveys that met the study criteria. There were a few more who completed them, but they didn't meet the study criteria. The sample of parents included more women, 91.7, mostly women, than men, and participants were predominantly between the ages of 45 and 60. Most respondents were white, non-Hispanic, and lived in the United States, although less than that. There's United Kingdom and stuff, you can look it up in, in, in table one. Um, most respondents had a bachelor's degree or graduate degree. You add those two together, there's over two thirds of them had you know, a bachelor's and above. The adolescents and young adults described by their parents were predominantly female sex at birth, 82.8%, which is wildly different from the standard uh, childhood onset gender dysphoria patients, which are largely male, um, with an average current age of 16.4 years. Uh, that's not surprising because all of these people had to be at least adolescent. I'm not surprised that nobody's below 11. I'm sorry. Um, and here's uh, uh, the natal females, people who started out as girls, expressing sexual orientation before announcement. You will notice that 27% were uh, gay or lesbian, 36% were bisexual, 35% were straight, and 26% they didn't have it on, on the, uh, on the, and there were 8.5 percent who were not interested in sex at all. Um, the natal males, on the other hand, were mostly straight, 56.8 percent, with some bisexual, gay, and few asexual, and and 25 percent did not express. The gender dysphoria began mostly during, well, mostly after puberty, but um, really pretty closely split. Um, along with the rapid rise of uh, gender dysphoria, the, the uh, uh, shall we say, subjects, 45% um, uh, had both belonged to a friend group where other friends are turning trans, and 
had an increase in social media internet use. There's a certain percentage that just had the friends and there's a certain percentage that had an increase in the social media use only, but neither is only 5.1% and don't know even if you pile that in, that's only 13.3%. So almost all of these people are either friends or, or the internet or both are influencing them. Now they give this survey and the, they mentioned that the participation in this study was voluntary and its purpose was clearly described in the recruitment information. Electronic consent was contained. There was logic embedded in the survey that disqualified surveys that answered no or skipped the question about whether the child had a sudden or rapid onset of gender dysphoria. You didn't answer that question. You didn't count and 23 surveys were disqualified right off the, of the bat. Measures a basic demographic and baseline characteristics. The question, has your child been formally identified as academically gifted, learning disabled, both or neither? Notice that this isn't a question of, do you think your child is academically gifted? This is, has they, have they been formally identified? Was used as a proxy to estimate rates of rates of academic giftedness and learning disabilities. So when you see that, that's the criterion. Uh, the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria in children um, consists of eight indicators of gender, uh, gender dysphoria. To notice that th there's a reference behind that. To meet criteria for diagnosis, a child must manifest at least six out of eight indicators, including the one designated A1. In other words, you don't answer A1 positively, you flunk right there. A strong desire to be the other gender, or an insistence that one is the other gender, or some alternative gender different from one's assigned gender. Um, and you can see there's, there's criterion one. That has to be in there. And then in boys, there's a... a cross-dressing, typical, or for girls, masculine clothing. There's roles in make-believe. There's a uh, preference for toys, games. There's strong preference for playmates. Uh, in boys, there's a strong rejection of typically masculine toys. Uh, I suppose that's guns, trucks, stuff like that. And in girls, a strong rejection of t typically feminine toys, dolls, etc. A strong dislike of one's sexual anatomy and a strong desire for the primary and or secondary characteristics that match one's experienced gender versus one's birth gender or natal gender as it's sometimes phrased. The condition, now the, the other thing is for DS, uh, gender dysphoria in children, the condition has to be so associated with clear, clinically significant distress or impairment in school, social, or other important areas of functioning. So the definition is not for people who kind of are that way, but they, they seem to be fine otherwise. Exposure to friend groups and social media internet content. I'm just going to go over a few things that they look at. Behaviors, outcomes, and clinical indications, coping with strong or negative emotions. And then data analysis, again, we'll skip through some of that. And go through the results, baseline characteristics. Baseline characteristics included that the vast majority of parents, these are the parents reporting this stuff, favor gay and lesbian couples, couples right to legally marry. So this is not people who are angry about gays. And believe that transgender individuals deserve the same rights and protections as other individuals in their country. 90% almost. So these, again, these are not people who are angry about gay, uh, trans people either. They're uh, trans, whatever, you know, and no, you shouldn't bother them. It is important to note that none of the adolescents or young adults described in this study would have met diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria in childhood. None. Of course, that was an exclusion criterion. In fact, the vast majority had zero, 80.4% you couldn't have told at all. Had zero indicators from the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for childhood gender dysphoria, with 12.2 possessing one. So that means better than 90% had one or less, and so forth. The uh, 
adolescents or young adults who were the focus of the study and many comorbidities and vulnerabilities predating the onset of their gender dysphoria, including psychiatric disorders, neurodevelopmental disabilities, trauma, non-suicidal self-injury, that's things like cutting, and difficulties coping with strong or negative emotions. The majority of adolescents and young adults had one or more diagnos diagnoses of a psychiatric disorder or neurodevelopmental disability preceding the onset of the gender dysphoria. They're not just pure, but I want you to notice they're gifted. Many had experienced uh, a traumatic or stressful event prior to the onset of their gender dysphoria. Open text descriptions of trauma were categorized as family, including parental divorce, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. sex or gender related, such as rape, etc., um, social, such as bullying, social isolation, moving, or psychiatric, and medical. But now many of them have, but what that means is most of them had not. Almost half of adolescents young, and young adults were engaged in non-suicidal self-injury. Wow. Behavior before the onset of gender dysphoria. Coping styles for these uh, adolescents and young adults including having a poor or extremely poor ability to handle negative emotions productively and being overwhelmed by strong emotions and trying to avoid or go to great lengths to avoid experiencing them. The majority of respondents answered their, uh, that their child had social anxiety during adolescence, 44.3% that their children ha child had difficulty interacting with their peers, and 43.1% that their child had a history of being isolated, not associating with their peers outside of school activities. Announcing a transgender identification, at the time the adolescent or young adult announced they were transgender identified or came out. Most were living at home with one or both parents. Small number were at college. Most of the parents, over 80%, answered affirmatively that their child's announcement of being transgender came out of the blue without significant prior evidence of gender dysphoria. One day they came home and said, Mom, I'm trans. Boom. Almost a third of respondents noted that their child did not seem gender dysphoric when they made their announcement. And 26% said the length of time from not seeking gender dysphoric, uh, seeming gender dysphoric to announcing a transgender identity was between less than a week to three months. Uh, you didn't get a lot of warning. The most striking examples of not seeming at all gender dysphoric prior to making the announcement, including a daughter who loved summers and seemed to love how she looked in a bikini, another daughter who happily wore bikinis and makeup, and another daughter who previously said, I love my body, and then all of a sudden didn't. The majority of respondents believed that their child was using language that they found online when they came out. Total of 130 participants provided optional open text re responses to this question. Responses fell into the following categories. Why they thought the child was, they, they said why the child was using it, why they thought the child was using it. Um, a description of what the child said but didn't actually provide a reason, they just said they thought it was happening. Or something else about the conversation or the child and don't know. What are some of the things that they're talking about? Um, they reproduced, uh, the, uh, the reason why they thought they were reproducing language online the top two reasons were that it didn't sound like the child's voice and that the parent later looked online and recognized the same words and phrases that their child used when they announced the transgender identity. The observation that it didn't sound like their child's voice was also expressed as sounding scripted, like their child was reading from a script, wooden, like a form letter, and it didn't sound like the child's words. Somebody's putting words in their mouth is what it sounded like. P parents describe finding the words their child said to them verbatim, word for word, practically copy and paste, and identical in online and other sources. The following quotes capture these top two uh, uh, observations. One parent said, it seems different from the way she usually talked. I remember thinking it was like hearing somebody who had memorized a lot of definitions from a vocabulary test, for a vocabulary test. 
Another respondent said the email read like all of the narratives posted online, almost word for word. Yeah, that's me. Oh, I'm going to use the same words too. The following case summaries were selected to illustrate peer trauma and psychiatric context that might indicate more complicated clinical pictures. 12-year-old natal female was bullied specifically for going through early puberty and the res responding parent wrote, as a result she said she felt fat and hated her breasts. She learned online that hating your breasts is a sign of being transgender. She edited her diary by crossing out existing text and writing in new text to make it appear that she has always felt that she is transgender. Talk about an edited narrative. A 14-year-old natal female and three of her natal female friends were taking group lessons together with a very popular coach. The coach came out as transgender and within one year, all four students announced they were also transgender. Somehow that doesn't sound like genetics. A natal female was traumatized by a rape when she was 16 years of age. Before the rape, she was described as a happy girl. After the rape, she became withdrawn and fearful. Several months after the rape, she announced she was transgender and told her parents that she needed a transition. I guess that's one way of avoiding rape. A 21-year-old natal male who had been academically successful at a prestigious university seemed depressed for about six months. Since concluding he was transgender, he went on to have a marked decline in his social functioning and has become increasingly angry and hostile to his family. He refuses to move out or look for a job. His entire family, including several members who are very supportive of the transgender com community in general, believe that he is suffering from a mental disorder which has nothing to do with gender. A 14-year-old natal female and three of her natal female friends are part of a larger friend group that spends much of their time talking about gender and sexuality. The three natal female friends all announced that they were trans boys and chose similar masculine names. After spending time with these three friends, the 14-year-old natal female announced that she was also a trans boy. The majority, 75%, of the surveyed parents felt that their child was incorrect in their belief of being transgender. More than a third of the adolescents and young adults asked for medical and or surgical transition at the same time they announced they were transgender identified. Mommy, I'm transgender and I want surgery. Two thirds of the adolescents and young adults told their parents they wanted to take cross sex hormones. 58.7 uh, that they wanted to see a gender therapist, gender clinic, and 53.4% that they wanted surgery for transition. Almost a third of the adolescents and young adults brought up the issue of suicide in transgender teens as a reason that their parents should agree to treatment. More than half of the uh, adolescent and young adults had very high expectations that transitioning would solve their problems in social, academic, occupational, or mental health areas. Do this, we'll, we'll all be fixed. While 43.9% of adolescents and young adults were willing to work on basic mental health before seeking gender treatments, a sizable minority were not willing to work on their basic mental health before seeking gender treatment. You gotta fix this, you gotta fix it now, and no, I don't wanna take care of repression. At least two parents relayed that their child discontinued psychiatric care and medications for pre-existing mental health conditions once they identified as transgender. One parent in response to the question about their child had very high expectations that transitioning would solve her problem, elaborated, very much so. She discontinued antidepressant quickly, stopped seeing the psychiatrist, began seeing gender therapists, stopped healthy eating. She stated none of it, minding what she ate and taking her prescriptions, mattered anymore. This was her cure, in her opinion. Um, friend group exposure. The adolescent and young adult children were on average 14.4 years old when their first friend became transgender identified. Within friendship groups, the average number of individuals who became transgender identified was 3.5 per group. That's the average. And 36.8% of the friends 
uh, friend groups described, the majority of individuals in the group became transgender identified. Became. The order that the focal, uh, the one that's being talked about, uh, came out compared to the rest of their friendships was calculated from the 119 participants who provided the number of friends coming out before and after their child and 74.8% of the adolescents and young adults were first, second, or third of their group. Usually they led the group or uh, at least were in, in, in the first wave, shall we say. Parents describe intense group dynamics where friend groups praised and supported people who were transgender identified and ridiculed and maligned non-transgender people. Where popularity, status, and activities were known, 60.7% of the adolescents and young adults experienced an increased popularity within their friend group when they announced a transgender identification. And 60% of the friend groups were known to mock people who were not transgender or We'll leave that out. <clears throat> For the question about popularity changes when the child came out as having a transgender identification, 79% participants provided op optional open text responses. One response had great increase in popularity among the student body at large. Being trans is a gold star in the eyes of other teens. Another respondent explained not so much popularity increasing as status. Also, she became untouchable in terms of bullying in school, as teachers who ignored homophobic bullying are now all at pains to be hot on the heels of any trans bullying. It's kind of a sad commentary, isn't it? Two described a temporary increase in their child's popularity. There was immediate rush of support when he came out. Those same friends have dwindled to nothing as he rarely speaks to any of them now. Another described the loss of friends, and two parents described the coming out of pre prevented the loss of friends, explained by one respondent as, to not be trans, one would not have been included in his group. Peer pressure. Several adolescents or young adults expressed significant concern about the potential repercussions from their friend group when they concluded they were not transgender after all. So there's some of these people came and came and went, shall we say. Um, there were two unrelated cases with similar trajectories where the adolescent or young adults spent some significant time in a different setting, away from their usual friend group, without access to the internet. Parents described that these uh, adolescents or young adults made new friendships, became romantically involved with another person, and during their time away concluded that they were not transgender after all. In both cases, the adolescents, rather than face their school friends, asked to move and transfer to different high schools. One parent said that their child couldn't face the stigma of going back to school and being branded as a fake or phony, or worse, a traitor or some kind of betrayer, and asked us if we could move. In the other case, the parent relayed that their child thought none of the original friends would understand and expressed a strong desire to get out of the culture that if you are cis, then you are bad or oppressive or clueless. Interesting culture. Both families were able to relocate and both respondents reported that their teens have thrived in their new environment and new schools. One respondent described that their child expressed relief that medical transition was never started and felt there would have been pressure to move forward had the family not moved away from the peer group. So, looks like that one dodged a bullet. Quantitative analysis, qualitative analysis, I'm gonna let that go. Um, or part of it. Theme, groups targeted. The groups targeted for marking by the friends groups are often heterosexual, straight people, and non-transgender people, called cis or cisgender. Sometimes animosity was also directed towards males, white people, gay and lesbian, but non-transgender people, aromantic and asexual people, and TERFs. One participant explained they are constantly putting down straight white people for being privileged, dumb, and boring. I guess I will be put down then. <clears throat> Another participant elaborated, in general, 
Cisgendered people are considered evil and unsupportive, regardless of their actual views on the topic. To be heterosexual, comfortable with the gender you were assigned at birth, and non-minority places you in the most evil of categories. Uh, in, with this group of friends. Statements of opinions by the evil cisgendered population are considered phobic and discriminatory and are generally discounted as unenlightened. So don't listen to me. Um, individuals targeted, behaviors occurring both in person and online settings, examples of behaviors. Participants gave many examples of observed behaviors that are mocking towards non-transgender people and non-LGB people. By the way, I, I must say, say this, that uh, uh, this paper has much more riches that I could not include. So um, I advise you read the whole thing. One participant said, my daughter, uh, my daughter called me a breeder and said things in a mocking straight person voice. Her friends egg her on while she does this. Another parent offered, if they aren't mocking cis people, they are playing pronoun police and mocking people who can't get the pronouns correct. Another participant said, new vocabulary t includes cis stupid and cis stupidity. And a fourth participant described, they assume anyone is critical about being transgender. Even just asking questions is either ignorant or filled with hate. Emphasizing victimhood, consequences of behaviors, all of these things are interesting, but I don't have time to include them all. Internet and social media exposure. Uh, AYAs have received online advice including how to tell if they're transgender, the reasons they should transition right away, that if their parents did not agree for them to take hormones, that the parents were abusive and transphobic, and uh, if, that if they waited to transition, they would regret it. What to say and what not to say to a doctor or therapist in order to convince them to provide hormones, that if their parents were reluctant to, to take hormones, them for hormones, they should use the suicide narrative. They should use the suicide narrative, telling parents that there is a high rate of suicide in transgender teens to convince them. And that it is acceptable to lie or withhold information about one's medical or psychological history from a doctor or therapist in order to get hormones or get hormones faster. Two respondents in answer to other, the other questions described that their children later told them what they learned online, discussion sites, and lists and sites. One parent reported he has told us recently that he was on a bunch of discussion site lists and learned tips there, places where teens and other trans people swap info. Like to use words, uh, the therapist when describing your gender dysphoria, because they are code for potentially suicidal and will get you a diagnosis and a prescription for hormones. Quick, we gotta stop this. Another parent disclosed the threat of suicide was huge leverage. What do you say to that? It's hard to have a steady hand and say no to medical transition when the other option is dead kids. She learned to say things that would push our buttons and get what she wanted and she has told us now that she learned that from trans discussion sites. They know what they're dealing with. Skipping over a paragraph, mental well-being, mental health and behavior, skipping over three paragraphs. There was a subset of eight cases where the parents described watching their child have declining mental well-being as they became gender dysphoric and gender, transgender identified and then had improved mental well-being as they dropped or backed away from a transgender identification. One parent described a marked change with her daughter when she was out of school temporarily. Her routine was interrupted. She spent all day on the internet and lost many of her school friends. Her only friends were online and members of the trans community. In three months, my daughter announced she is trans, gender dysphoric, wants binders and top surgery, testosterone sh shots. She started self-harming. Now back at school, she tweeted that she's so young, isn't sure she, she, if she's trans, no longer wants to be referred to by the male name she had chosen. Since she has started back at school and is being exposed to a wide variety of people, she is way happier. Uh, skipping on, uh, the higher than expected rates of non-heterosexual orientations of the uh, um, subjects prior to announcement of a transgender identity may suggest that the desire to be the opposite sex could stem from experiencing homophobia as a recent study showed that the being the recipient of homophobic name calling from one peers was associated with a change in gender identity for, for adolescents. 
the potential relationship of experienced homophobia and the development of um, rapid onset gender dif dysphoria deserves further study. Think about that one. Um, emerging hypotheses, hypothesis one, contagious, social contagion is a key determinant of rapid onset gender dysphoria. And I'm not going to say too much about it because we've been through most of the data, but there, there are many insights from our understanding of peer contagion and eating disorders and anorexia that may apply to the potential peer contagion of rapid onset gender dysphoria. Just as friendship cliques can set the level of preoccupations within one's body, body image, weight, and techniques for weight loss, so too may friendship cliques set a level of preoccupation with one's body, body image, gender, and techniques to transition, drawing a direct parallel between anorexia nervosa and transgenderism. That's hot topic, topic, but it looks like it's coming out of the data. That's a problem. Hypothesis two, um, uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria is a maladaptive coping mechanism for uh, uh, adolescents and young adults. Examples of maladaptive co coping mechanisms include the use of alcohol, drugs, or self-harm to distract oneself from experiencing painful emotions. One reason that the treatment of anorexia nervosa is so challenging is that the drive for extreme weight loss and weight loss activities can become a maladaptive co coping mechanism that allows the patient to avoid feeling and dealing with strong emotions. Whew. Skipping on, reflections, just uh, strengths of the study, the weakness of the study. Notice that the writer recognizes that there are weaknesses. The limitations of this study include that it is a descriptive study with the purpose of delineating a, a, a delineating previously unrecognized, I think that should read delineating A, but that's the way it came out, um, previously unrecognized specific population of adolescents and young adults identifying as transgender and developing hypotheses about the origins and significance of rapid onset gender dysphoria. This is not a prevalent study and does not attempt to evaluate the degree to which this presentation of a socially mediated onset of gender dysphoria or the use of the drive to transition as a maladapting coping mechanism is widespread in the population. It just says it's there, it doesn't say how frequent. Skipping on this research does not imply that no yeah. um. yes. there were two hundred sixty six 256. 56. Parents, families? Right. Parents or families? Uh, parents. Uh, parents. So they were randomly chosen? They were not randomly chosen. No, they, they self-selected. And they self-selected to be either on websites or known by other people. And then, and then they just took this group. And so it's important to keep in mind that this does not give you any kind of, I mean, they've given you the numbers that they got, but the numbers that they got may be, because they're self-selected, uh, may very mm -hmm. well be not representative of the general population. And they're not from one specific area of the country, they're from anywhere in the internet. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're not even all from the United States. There's a few from the United Kingdom and a few from Canada and so forth. Okay. The research does not imply that no um, adolescents or young adults who become transgender identified during their adolescent or young adult years had earlier symptoms, nor does it imply that no adolescents or young adults would ultimately benefit from transition. Rather, it suggests that not all, and that's enough to damn you in certain circles. Circum circles. Um, not all Adventist, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, uh, <coughs> adolescents or young adults presenting at these vulnerable ages are correct in their self-assessment of the cause of their symptoms. Some may have been employing a drive to transition as a maladaptive coping mechanism and that careful evaluation is essential to protect patients from the clinical harms of overtreatment and undertreatment. So you have to look at this very carefully. Um, and that's all she's, all she's arguing is that there's this phenomenon out there and you shouldn't just take these people at their word without checking. 
Conclusion, rapid onset gender dysphoria describes a phenomenon where the ra development of rap uh, gender dysphoria is observed begin suddenly during or after puberty in an adolescent or young adult who would not have met criteria for gender dysphoria in childhood. Rapid onset gender dysphoria appears to represent an entity that is distinct in etiology from the gender dysphoria observed in individuals who have previously been described as transgender. The research is not automatically transferable. It is plausible that rapid onset gender dysphoria represents an egosyntonic maladapting coping mechanism. Feels good, but it's not a good idea for some uh, adolescents or young adults, and that peer group and online influences may contribute to its uh, development. It is unknown whether the gender dysphoria, rapid onset gender dysphoria, is temporary or likely to be long term. Sometimes it appears to re uh, reverse, sometimes it doesn't, but nobody knows what happens there. The elevated number of friends per friendship group who became transgender identified. The pattern of cluster outbreaks of transgender identification in these friendship groups. The substantial percentage of friendship groups where the majority of the members became transgender identified and the peer group dynamics observed all serve to support the plausibility of social and peer contagion for rapid onset gender dysphoria. The worsening of mental well-being and parent-child relationships and behaviors that isolate teens from their parents, families, non-transgender friends, and mainstream sources of information are particularly concerning. More research needs to be, is needed to better understand rapid onset gender dysphoria, its implications, and scope. And with that last sentence, I would certainly agree. Now, my take on this, I think Dr. Littman appears to be describing a real phenomenon with a reasonable initial study. One can claim, I suppose, that all the parents are lying. However, the evidence cited proves that some of the adolescents and young adults have been coached to lie, and that some of them have been, have reportedly admitted to lying, and unless you want to say that nothing the parents say is any good, and of course that's what some people say, nothing that a non-trans person says is any good. Um, and in fact, one case has an edited diary after the fact. Went back and changed the story. Thus, the evidence strongly suggests that at least in some cases, what is being observed is a social phenomenon, at least as much as a hereditary one, or even one largely determined by early childhood experiences. It could be that the studied group is atypical. But in my opinion, the solution for that is more and better designed studies. The outcry, which we'll discuss next week, appears designed specifically to stop that. Now, I want to ob observe something that, that may not have been obvious or explicit, but a kind of morality, in fact, informs this study. Anorex anorexia nervosa is counterproductive according to Littman, which I agree with, by the way, even though egocentonic, it feels good, but it's damaging and should be discouraged. Gender reassignment surgery may very well be good in some cases, um, although I can tell you that the gender surgeons are a little more skeptical, but can be abused. The author does not take issue with either homosexuality or at least in principle transgenderism itself. She's just saying this particular brand of trans transgenderism is, is counterproductive. The happiness of clients is a good and it's perhaps the supreme good. I haven't found anything that uh, would disagree with that. The a uh, paper seems to take the position, which again I agree with, that um, truth is good and lying is generally bad. Bullying is bad, which again I agree with, and that drugs, alcohol, or playing computer games in response to a poor test score is bad, and studying harder is good. We can couch that with adaptive or maladaptive, but it means the same thing. I would point out that I think some kind of uh, morality seems inescapable. In fact, if you go with the other people, 
they have a morality too. Transgender good, cis bad. It's just the reverse of the standard morality. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Um, Jack. Is this on? Yeah, yep. it is. Okay. Very interesting. Uh, in a sense, the the other major social concern in, in <clears throat> today's social environment, in many of the Western cultures, uh, homosexuality is also a gender identity uh, situation. Um, sort of. Ge uh, the identifying of a gender that they want to relate to. Yeah. yeah. What's, what's fascinating to but me... That, but that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that does not involve what one might call gender denial. No. Whereas, whereas in this case... It, no, it really but does. it's certainly gender focused. Yes. That yes. was that was a point I would. Of course, to, one right. can argue that uh, heterosexuality in the, in our uh, society perhaps uh, has gone a little overboard too. Mm -hmm. But yes, like mo like most everything. <laughs> yes. But uh, one comment I would make, actually, I I do have in my family, uh, n not our our immediate family, but uh, homosexuality, and. Having read a lot into it, the most fascinating comparison between the two to me is the very high pre prevalence of social and behavioral dysfunction within the family. This is now identified by the, the most, well, I think I'm Macron saying, in terms of homosexuality, uh, they document the high association with emotional, social, family problems, and pretty much discount genetics as the determinative factor. Um, if you go back to the Wayback Machine that we have, uh, you'll find that we did a study on twin studies and so homosexuality showing that something of the order of 25% was influenced by uh, either genetics or prenatal influences. Since you're doing twin studies, you can't separate those out very well. Yes, genetics is a factor. But it's not the, it's not the overwhelming factor. It, it can be predisposing, but there are other things that are now being taken, I believe, in looking at the recent literature, as even more Determinative yeah. than genetics. and the the, other, the the scary part is that if you want to take that as as justification for it, it turns out that uh, twin studies have shown that pedophilia is uh, uh, genetically influenced as well to a roughly similar extent. About I think seventeen percent in the study. Yes, that that's right. Done. But it's a but it's there, yeah. and, well, and so I, I'm not sure that one can say that because it is genetically influenced that therefore we should leave it alone. No, no, of course, but uh, I've been very fascinated as a neuroscientist to read the original literature, uh, which was most, most influenced initially by a homosexual male scientist who found the homosexuality gene. Which has been not, totally debunked. Yeah, it's not held up. Yeah. Comment here and then... Uh, yeah. Uh, just, just a uh, simple question here. Uh, did they do any genetic evaluation in this study here? Uh, How in the world would you do that? when you got people by survey monkey and you never actually saw the people. That would be tough. Ask them to send in a swab. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> don't forget that, that the person who did this study got no funding whatsoever for it. 
just did it. So that means, I suppose that it costs something to set up SurveyMonkey. So she said, oh, $20 or $200 or whatever it is, and, mm -hmm. and just paid it and, and was done with it. At least, uh, I'm assuming that SurveyMonkey doesn't do these for free. So ask the parents to send in some money uh, along with their swab. <laughs> there are probably a few parents who would be willing to send the money too, that's, that's true. Well, I mean, you could always crowdsource this stuff, I suppose. Um, but yeah, this, this is an interesting study being done on basically a shoestring budget. Um, and they got it through the IRB with no funding. That's, that's just amazing. Um, don't, uh, don't you think that if uh, there was a pass the mic genetic up, uh, component, don't you think that if there was a genetic component to homosexuality that those genes would be stamped out of the population in a very short number of generations? No. Nope. Why not? Because uh, cystic fibrosis has not been stamped out yet. Um, uh, is it being replenished at a certain rate? Well, that, that's one of the things is that if there is a genetic component, we don't know whether it's easily mutatable, whether there are several parts of it that would be mutatable and it would be able to be gotten rid of. Um, but the other problem is that uh, there is pressure for homosexuals to behave heterosexually some of the time. And you know, you only have to do it once to leave a kid. But at a lower frequency in the population than... Yeah, but see, the, people believe that, ev that uh, natural selection is this um, massively efficient mechanism. It is horribly inefficient. Let's supposing that homosexuals leave, uh, leave uh, first of all, they're not always pure. Um, and let's supposing that they leave half of the descendants. Okay, you have the problem of the, of the addition rate, and then you have the problem of you still leave half the descendants. And so they're there. And uh, the next generation is a quarter, the next generation an eighth. I mean, assuming that it's perfectly efficient, um, it may not be that easy. And if, they, if, if societal pressure is strong enough for these people to behave heterosexually, even though their feelings may be different, uh, then you're actually going to have 90% or 95% or something like that. The difference in reproductive uh, uh, ability, shall we say, uh, may be so small as to take decades, centuries to get rid of it and by that time you have new ones. And you may even have people who, let, let's supposing that homosexuals part of the time are bisexual, um, or can, uh, you know, uh, then you will wind up not separating them out as cleanly as you think you should. Um, there's some pretty good evidence for, uh, you know, for example, homosexual a activity in ancient Greece, but those people also had wives who they, uh, uh, impregnated on a regular basis too. And you know, how often do you have to have sex with your wife in order to have kids? Well really once a year would be plenty. As long as you're fertile. So it may not be as easy to get rid of the gene by just naturally, well if they have sex with men they can't have kids. Um, Yes, if it was, you know, if you went out and shot every homosexual, you'd probably decrease the homosexual population. Um, that, I understand, is an option in some countries. 
Um, but they still throw them off buildings. That means they're still there. Maybe in a lower percentage, but it doesn't get rid of it. So even 100% selection doesn't do the job. So, I, I mean, I'm inclined to believe that there's a significant um, developmental factor here that may not be related to genetics. I, you wouldn't get any argument with me on that. In fact, that's what I said. The twin studies argue that it is developmental. And he was arguing that, that, um, that, the, um, that there's significant pathology associated with this. Okay. Well, <clears throat> while the microphone's being passed around, I'm fascinated with this just from a broad overview, not knowing a whole lot in detail about the topic. But as we all know, there's the nature versus nurture debate, and most of the questions and comments are about that. And, and, and it's an important debate in this setting because if it is all nature, then one can reasonably raise the question of uh, discrimination. If True. it is nurture, then the arguments become a bit more difficult to make. Exactly. Now, do I assess this correctly, that just about 100% of the study is dealing with the nurture and not taking into consideration, except maybe in the back of the researcher's mind, the uh, nature aspect is like, how do you demonstrate uh, nature with this kind of study? Well, it's already been mentioned, yeah, it'd be very, very hard to do. Well, I think that what she is making a case for, and I think she makes a good case, is that some of this is in fact nurture. How much of it she doesn't want to say because she doesn't have the data to, to, to back it up. And I don't blame her for that. Uh, and in fact, that's a sign of a good writer, is, uh, a good science writer, is to not take your conclusions beyond what you exactly. can support. Um, then, and that, you know, She's suggesting this is a possibility and we need to look at it, but that, but that um, it, there does look like there is, at least some of it, is, is nurture, is concentrated nurture of a particular kind, and she's not saying it, but I'll say it, that could theoretically be undermined and that, that therefore some people who come out as trans didn't need to and uh, that it's worth fighting over the, uh, over the culture to not be as supportive of, uh, you have to be careful, I, I don't wanna say not be supportive of trans people at all but I want to say that, that maybe not be supportive of the, of the overarching narrative that has been put on it. In fact, I think that one of the things that we've done, and it's mentioned there, is we have uh, sometimes mistreated homosexuals sure. and that we have actually driven some of this by creating, in, in a certain sense, a counterculture that has no... Um, that has no balancing effect. Uh, that isn't to say that it's all our fault, but I'm saying that sometimes it is partly our fault and I think that where it is, we need to correct that. I do not think that, I think, th if I can put it this way, uh, people who are homosexuals and who are transgender have enough pain in their life we don't need to add to it unless there's a really, really good reason. And there aren't a lot of really, really good reasons. You know, do we treat smokers that way? Well, I guess some of us do. 
Um, uh, well, yeah, but on the uh, but on the other hand, I mean, if if you run into somebody who smokes and you're, you know, I don't know, an office setting, if you're a talking uh, friends, uh, you know, um, do you treat them like they're pariahs? Well, I think most of us would say no. You, that's not really appropriate. Uh, I would argue that. Well, let me ask you if. If, if you run into people who, um, let's say, are uh, sleeping around or have paramours, do you, do you immediately shun them? I mean, that's the Jehovah's Witness way, you know, um, that uh, is, is that the appropriate response? You know, uh, Jesus seems to have been a little more comfortable with sinners than some of his contemporaries felt was appropriate. Um, I don't think Jesus ever told people who sinned that they weren't sinning. He just befriended them anyway. Um, and I'm suggesting that uh, that that model might not be a bad one. But on the other hand, I don't know that anybody is going to be able to, uh, at least I hope nobody's going to be able to, uh, make me say that this is all just normal. It's the way things are and it's the way God made us and we just should take it. And not, and not, uh, and it, that's one of the reasons why when I finished I pointed out that the paper has a morality. It says anorexia nervosa is not good. It says that drinking because you failed a test is not good or you know, playing video games or various other things. Those are coping mechanisms that are not good. And that studying harder for the next test is good. And I agree with her on that. There are things that are better than others. You know, it, it's kind of crazy that the same people who will argue that there's no really morality of anything, then object to your uh, to your being cis even. Let alone your saying that cis is better. Isn't, isn't that a little on the weird side that they take and say your morality is no good because there's no morality and then they turn right around and try to say and you're being immoral? That's you know, it's flipping logic on its head. And so I, I think we have to maintain the truth, but I think we have to maintain it, if I can put it that way, in love.